All right, so we will be looking at rightly dividing the word of truth as we began last week. We'll talk more about that as we go, but uh, I want to talk about a few news items before we actually get to the recording that we will put up. I ran across this on Facebook. I showed you this guy several months ago who did something about DNA that was just fascinating, and he's done this about Psalm 139, 13, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Turns out that means something actually scientific. Well, very clearly says in Psalm 139, verse 13, that you were knit together in your mother's womb. Well, when we take a microscopic look into the cell, we find this. This is a string-like structure called a microtubule. When we take a closer look at the microtubule, we see an uncanny resemblance of string. This microtubule is essential to the structure of your cell. Without it, your cell would not hold together. When we take a closer look at the microtubule, we find out something even more interesting. The microtubule itself is made out of smaller strings. And the smaller strings are made of even smaller strings. Going so far down to the chromosome itself, everything resembles intertwined string. This is your nervous system. This is your connective tissue. These are microtubules. Part 21. So when God says what he says, he doesn't waste words. He means precisely what he says. We were knit together. <laughs> this is someone knitting. <clears throat> only on a scale that we can only imagine. So, there's a picture that I found at Bethlehem, Christmas, entitled, This is What Christmas Looks Like in Palestine, 2023. It's a nativity scene inside of a church, and it's a baby laying in rubble to show solidarity with the people of Gaza. It's a Presbyterian church. No, but this Presbyterian church put this altar, I guess you could call it together, and there in the center is the baby Jesus with a Palestinian flag. There's just no bottom. We never find the bottom. And then here's the Pope, Christmas Mass, typical Catholic thing, but look at the background. We've got three wise men, only they're the three, three previous popes. That seems a little funky to me. And Joseph and the baby have a Palestinian flag on them. Not flag, a Palestinian garb. You know, Americans aren't trying to get to Guatemala. And that's because the West, America, being the shining light of that, is a good, caring culture with all of our flaws and everything that's wrong. And people are drawn to that. They yearn for it. Now, I'm doing this because it's been on my heart that this is now flipped upside down. America is no longer what it was. This is all being reversed right before our eyes in a matter of a few years. And what was there under the surface is actually beginning to come out. It was there before, but it's actually starting to come out now. Now, I, I don't mean to be depressing and discouraging. That's the reality. So if we're the last bastion of this good, caring society, imagine a world where Jesus had not existed. That's what we're coming to. So, <clears throat> rightly dividing the word of truth. We 
began to look at this last week, and I did so because it is fundamental to understanding the Bible rightly. And we're going to look at dispensational theology, and it's based on this verse right here. Study, Paul said, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turns out that means more than just some poetic words that somebody said. It is the basis for the Bible believer. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. We looked at this last week. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But for the, the Bible believer who is dispensational, we'll talk a little bit about that. What it means is we take the Bible literally everywhere we can. Now, people who are not dispensational in their theology look at us and they say, well, you take everything literal in the Bible. No, you take everything literal that you can. There are things that are obviously not intended to be literal. And that's a whole study in and of itself. But the Bible believer who is dispensational in his theology takes the Bible literally. And I told you that the Bible can be taken in one or four of these ways. Some verses of Scripture, all four of them will apply. Some, just one. But every Scripture has one of these values, or all four of them, for you. Someone once said, all the Bible is for you, but not all the Bible is written to you. So we're coming to make a distinction, a dividing. There's a difference between the Jew and and the Christian. When God was speaking to the Jew, he wasn't speaking to the Christian. And this is literally the key that unlocks the word of God. We talked about dividing scripture properly, and Paul ta or Peter talked about twisting scripture to their own destruction. So dispensational understanding of the Bible at its essence means to take it literally everywhere it is meant to be. Whenever it speaks symbolically or metaphorically, it is speaking of something real. And that is to be taken literally as truth. Now, that's the distinction. There will be a lot of people who will say, that's a metaphor. Well, it's a metaphor of something. Okay, look at the root and take the root literally. That's what it means to be dispensational. What this passage says to me versus what the Bible says. Your truth, that's good for you. But that's not the way I see it. That's not my truth. You know, that came up through the 80s big time. So we began to look at those two different theological systems. Covenant versus dispensational. Covenant Approach sees one covenant relationship manifested at different times through different men. Covenant theology dismisses Israel as a unique people of God, resulting in what we've talked about many times, replacement theology. You replace Israel and the church. The, the church takes all the promises of Israel now. Covenant theology allegorizes. Now, allegories, alleg allegories are a thing in the Bible. And whenever it is allegorized, you're welcome to take it that way. Look for the root for what it means. But to explain it away, because, oh, that's an allegory, or spiritualize it, that's not a smart thing to do. So dispensational theology recognizes an overarching plan for the ages divided into different relationships for each period. And Adam, in innocence, Adam, after the fall, Noah, we'll look at these very quickly in just a moment. In each one of these, God has tried to have a relationship with humanity. And at each one, including this one, including the millennial kingdom that's yet to come, will all fail in apostasy. And that's significant. They will all fail... This age is going to end with the church in apostasy. We're seeing it right before our eyes. The millennium also is going to end with Satan loose for a season and he's going to gather a crowd and go against the Christ. Recognizes the place of Israel and all the yet unfulfilled promises 
have a future fulfillment. This is the huge distinction. Dispensational theology says every promise in the Old Testament made to the Jew, to Israel, will be fulfilled. Covenant theology says no. They killed Christ. They no longer matter. So is the word dispensation in the Bible? That's a good question. Paul talked about it several times in Ephesians 3, 2, the dispensation of grace that he spoke of. Ephesians 1, 10, the dispensation of the fullness of time. That dispensation means that, that agreed period of time. Colossians 1, 24 to 26, the dispensation of God committed to Paul. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, 17, the dispensation of the gospel committed to Paul. Did you know there's more than one gospel in the Bible? We may talk about that before we get done. There's more than one gospel in the Bible. I mean, if nothing else, you can see we've got the gospel we've got now. But you've got a gospel over during the tribulation in the book of Revelation. It's a different gospel. It's not the same one. So here are the seven dispensations. This may be a little easier to see it this way. This includes all seven of them. And we talked last week about there are certain verses of Scripture that if you try to take Matthew 24, 13, it does not fit in grace. It does not fit in our gospel. Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. Well, Matthew 24 is during the tribulation. That's not true today. I'm saved forever at the moment I receive Christ. I don't have to make it to the end. I don't have to be faithful to the end. I hope I, I, hope I am. But that's not our contract. That's not our covenant. So, what must rightly be divided? Now, I'm going to run through a few of them, not all of them, but just enough to show you that it's really critical to divide them properly. Israel and the church, we've already talked about. Law and grace in the Bible are not spoken of the same way. If you're reading a verse of Scripture and it is under the law, don't try to make it force under grace or vice versa. Don't try to apply grace to somebody living under the old covenant. Faith and works. They are two different things, oftentimes complementary. Faith without works is dead, but you need to rightly divide them. And then the two natures. Even to the day we die, after we get saved, we're still going to have two natures, a spiritual and a new man. Uh, the flesh and the spirit right up to the end. And you need to know how a verse of Scripture is applying to that. Do you know there's five different resurrections in the Bible? So you need, to, you need to rightly know or divide which resurrection so-and-so is talking about. Your standing and your state. This is easily illustrated. Uh, a believer enters into a relationship with God at the moment they're saved. Were you a good boy or girl today? Well, you might have been a good girl or a boy. You might have been a bad girl or a bad boy. But at all times, if you were a son or a daughter of God, that was your standing. Your standing as a child of God. Your fellowship is something that changes with each stupid thing you say. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say it that way. Your fellowship with God, it's just like with your earthly father, probably. With my father, there were days when we got along really good, and there were days when, when I was bad, I was really bad. But I was still his son. So you need to know when you're reading Scripture how to divide between these two things, or you could be confused applying it wrongly. There are two advents. Jesus came as a suffering servant, 
but he's coming back one of these days as a king. You don't want to be taking a verse of scripture that applies to his kingdom standing one of these days and try to apply it to the baby in the manger. You know, he wasn't a king at that point. He had come to be the suffering servant. And so that distinction needs to be made. And then salvation and rewards are always spoken of differently in the New Testament. Salvation is always spoken of. You might want to write this down. Salvation is always spoken of as a free gift. Whereas rewards are always spoken of as earned. You're not getting any gifts if you don't earn them. You will get salvation because Jesus earned it for you. That, that's a critical distinction and a dividing of God's word. And then the two Adams, Paul made much of that in 1 Corinthians 15. First Adam, second Adam, Romans as well. So any questions at this point? You begin to see rightly dividing the word of truth is more than just words. It's an actual way of understanding the Bible. So Israel and the church. Oh, I've got. I duplicated a page and now we move on. <laughs> so we talked last week about three groups of people. You need to make a distinction between these. You know, rightly divide these three groups of people, Jews, church and Gentiles. There are things that are said to each of these three groups, promises that are made. You need to apply them rightly. So Israel and the church are different in their calling. We looked at that last week. Israel was called out in Genesis 12 by way of Abraham, but the church was called a whole different way. When Jesus was resurrected, he left his disciples and he formed them into the church. Israel and the church are different in their conduct, different things they were told to act like, different ways they're supposed to function, different in their worship. Israel was told you cannot come near. Whereas in the church, we have been called to come boldly before the throne of grace. We may come right up to him in our prayer time. Whereas Israel, they had to stand outside while Zacharias prayed inside. And then concerning their future, Israel has promises. They are earthly promises. They're going to get their earthly promises. But the church is going to be translated out of this world, and we have uh, New Jerusalem, and we have other promises that are made to us. That's not to say that Jerusalem is not a physical thing. It obviously is. But you get the distinction. Israel, that land is Israel's. God gave it to them. And the way he spoke of it, it in perpetuity, in perpetuity, ongoing. And we could look at those verses. You might want to write them down. Revelation 21, 1 and 2 and verses 9 through 10. I'm trying to move quickly to where we left off. And in our relationship, I think this is where we should pick up. Um, Israel had a contract with God. We do, too. But we call that with Israel uh, the covenant relationship. We have a new contract with God. It's called the new birth. We don't just enter into just a contract. We actually enter into a relationship where we know each other and love each other. You know, we don't just pray, as I said earlier, because we're told to pray. We pray because we like to pray. We pray because God's answered prayer. We pray because it's a wonderful thing. It's a law and grace kind of a thing. And in our identity, in the Old Testament, Israel is revealed as the bride of God. But in the New Testament, Jesus is uh, betrothed to the church. In blessings, we've talked about this a little bit, physical, earthly for Israel, spiritual and heavenly for the church. You know, Israel was promised, if you do this, 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 and this, you're going to have, your crops will grow, and your wives will have children, and you'll be prosperous. That's not the promise that we have. In this world, Jesus said, one of our promises, in this world, you shall have tribulation. 
So the, the, a distinction has to be made. So if you're reading an Old Testament promise to the Jews about prosperity, and that's what the health and wealth gospel people do, they're all the time reaching back to a promise to Israel and trying to apply it during grace, and it doesn't, it's not reality. And of course, the Gentiles are all the nations of the world except Israel. Israel is not actually revealed as a nation. There are nations and then there is Israel. And we are in the times of the Gentiles. You know, Daniel, book of Daniel, he was revealed the secret understanding of that statue. Remember that statue? Head of gold, arms and chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet, partly of iron, partly of clay. It was revealed to Daniel, and Daniel revealed it then to the king and everybody else, that that is, that is the outline of Gentile world rule. We are in that time of the Gentiles ruling the world. But that will come to an end one of these days. Luke 21, 24, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. That's where they are now. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that's an actual period of time. A dispensation. A lot of guys with talent put together pictures of these things that were in Scripture and this giant statue, you know, outline Babylonia, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. In fact, it's so, so eerily correct that liberal theologians look back at that and say, why, so somebody wrote this afterwards. You know, God's not capable of predicting that. It laid out just, and the characteristics, you know, Medo-Persia, two arms. God is good at what he does. I love the end of it. The feet partly of iron, partly of clay. Oh, that's a fascinating prophecy. We have yet to come to that, but I believe that we are coming to that, maybe, in transhumanism, where we're becoming Borg, where we're, we're getting uh, technology fused with actual biological humanity. And they don't cleave together. They don't hold together. It doesn't quite work. Now, they're, they're Elon Musk, Microsoft too, been working on hacking the human brain. And they may already be there. Some of the things they say, they're, they've already done it with monkeys. and, and uh, But they will be able to interface your brain with the internet or with Wi-Fi and do all kinds of wonderful things, they will be able to calm you down when you're excited. They will be able to make you vote for Biden again or some such thing. I'm being facetious, but not very. That's their intent. They will tell you about all the good things that they will do, but they're not all going to be good things. Agreed? And then that stone's going to come down. A stone cut out with hound is going to smash those feet to smithereens. So law and grace. These two are always presented as contrasting and should not be mingled. That each one is what it is. Law and grace characterize the two most distinctive of the seven dispensations, Jewish and Christian. John 1.17 for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It should be noted that law and grace are not found only within the two dispensations. It was a law to Adam not to eat the fruit, and grace caused God to supply a sacrifice to forestall immediate judgment. So they need to be kept separate but sometimes they do show up together. This is one example. The place and work 
of both law and grace are distinct and separate. Law tends to reveal the will of God. Grace tends to reveal the goodness of God. Yes. You could almost look at the statute as a kind of play around between law and grace and say in some respects, even though they were over there, they're still grace. And... Yeah. In the same way. Yeah. yeah. You know, you've heard me say it before, but I like saying it. We should all be really glad that God is good. What if he wasn't? What if he hadn't been? What if he had been like the Greek gods that play with humanity? Now he's working out a will, a plan, and he's going to execute that plan to the conclusion. And it would be for the good for all of those who will get on board with it. The law of God is prohibiting and requiring, whereas grace is God beseeching and bestowing. Someone said something a few years ago that just so struck me as truth. Chuck, Swin Chuck uh, Missler. He asked the question, the design and creation of the universe, the work of God's hands, right? The cross, everything leading up to it and the cross are the work of God's heart. Which would you say is more important? Well, I'm not sure it's a question you can ask because you have to have the one in order to have the other. You have to have the created universe. But I would argue that at least the thing I appreciate the most is the work of his heart. So here's a picture of law and grace coming from Sinai, do and live. Whereas once you come to the cross under grace, believe and live. Clarence Larkin. Clarence Larkin wrote, literally wrote the book Dispensational Theology. If you ever want to get it, you can get it. You still buy it. It's a massive book. It's about this wide. And it goes into huge detail. So the law. It is divided into categories. They're not all the same. Moral law, we know the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. But there is the civil law relating to the requirements of daily life, how the Jews were to live. We don't live under those laws, do we? No. No. We're not required. God didn't expect us to live under the civil law. The moral law extends, it is moral. I mean, it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to steal. There's our white kitty cat. <laughs> Making these rounds. So um, there's also the ceremonial law, how they were to do their religious activities in the temple. So while the moral law is in force always, before the law even, and after the law, it was wrong to steal, lie, murder, right? But the civil laws and the ceremonial law were not under those anymore. So, who was it for? Well, it was not given to the Gentiles. The law was not given to the Gentiles. God did not give it to them. God gave it exclusively to the Jews. An example would be the Sabbath. God did not give us the Sabbath. He gave the Sabbath as a sign to the Jews. That was a sign you were a Jew when you kept the Sabbath. Now, there's nothing wrong with keeping the Sabbath, but it was a gift to the Jews. It's not a gift to us. So, in you know, the Seventh-day Adventist perfect example, they take the Sabbath principle and they try to apply it under grace and it doesn't work. It's not to justify, Romans 3.20, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So the law can't save. It's to reveal the standard. Romans 3.20 tells us, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
you know, Paul talked about that to the Galatians uh, and other places. You know, the, uh, the law is our schoolmaster teaching us. It's not our way of salvation. It's a way of teaching us that we're in need of the cross, in need of salvation. And so we will stop there. 